My name is Jared Vaness, and I'm the Cereal and Pulse Fungicide Portfolio Manager at Bayer Crop Science. And today we're going to talk about fungicide resistance. So as application intensity increases across Western Canada, growers and industry are concerned for the potential fungicide resistance. And I, I think everyone has their the best intentions in mind because no one wants to end up as we have with herbicide resistance. So when considering the potential for fungicide resistance, uh, you have to consider three areas. You have to consider the pathogen that's being targeted as different pathogens have different risk factors. You have to consider the fungicide mode of action as the specific mode of action has different risk factors. And agronomic practices. There's certain things growers can do in their field to either increase or decrease the risk for potential uh, fungicide resistance. When evaluating the potential for fungicide resistance, you have to look at uh, the fungicide mode of action itself. There's a group called FRAC across the globe. They're the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. And essentially, they're a group of industry scientists that put forward recommendations on various modes of action and how to utilize them in the field in order to sustain the lifespan and efficacy of these specific modes of action. And what they've done is they've ranked the major modes of action across the globe. They start with, uh, for instance, strabilurins or your group 11s, they've ranked as high risk. Um, and essentially they look at, does the mode of action work on a single site? Does a single gene confer resistance? And does it have high and persistent activity? So SDHIs or group 7s, they rank as a medium to high risk mode of action and triazoles, or your group threes, they rank as a medium risk mode of action. So now that we've considered the fungicide mode of action, we also have to consider the pathogen to evaluate what our risk potential is for fungicide resistance. FRAC has also characterized many pathogens that are applicable to Western Canada and ranked them as high, medium, or low risk. And what they've come to is that powdery mildew, gray mold are considered high risk pathogens, Diseases such as sclerotinia, net blotch, and septoria would be medium risk. And diseases such as fusarium, rust, pythium are all low risk pathogens. So when evaluating the potential for a pathogen to become resistant to a fungicide, uh, scientists look at really seven key factors. Does the pathogen have a short life cycle or a multiple disease cycles per year? So is it monocyclic? versus polycyclic? Does the pathogen produce a lot of spores versus just a small amount? How does the pathogen spread? Does it spread through wind dispersal or just through the soil? Does the pathogen infect all growth stages or just a small component of the plant's growth stage? They also look at does it reproduce sexually where it can spread genetics out even further? Or in certain cases, if the resistance is recessive, you can also get masking when it comes to uh, sexual reproduction. And you also have to evaluate the pathogen's relative fitness after a mutation, if it's healthy versus non-healthy because of the mutation. And lastly, do they overwinter in Canada? Um, there's certain pathogens such as rust that don't overwinter here, so are not really a concern for the most part. Also, you have to consider agronomic considerations. So what can the grower do to reduce the risk to fungicide resistance. So you have to consider a couple things. So how many applications per year is the grower uh, utilizing that single mode of action? Um, how many applications are targeted on the same pathogen year over year? So is, is the grower using the same mode of action targeting the same pathogen year over year? Or is he targeting different pathogens? You also have to consider what rates are used. Are lethal rates being used or are sublethal rates being used? So there's certain differences among modes of action and how important this is. And also you have to look at, is the grower using resistant cultivars? Is he using irrigation and what time is he using irrigation? Is the grower using tillage and burying a lot of the, the residue so that the pathogen can't infect crops the next year? So all things that growers can consider to reduce their potential for fungicide resistance and when it comes down to you're just trying to suppress your pathogen populations. Fungicide resistance uh, to date in Western Canada has not really been a large concern. 
The only major issue that we've had has been strabilurin resistance ascochyta on chickpeas, which happened in the early 2000s. But other than that, resistance to fungicides has not really been a concern. But as application intensities increase with fungicides, we have to keep an eye on this and apply all FRAC guidelines when possible. So when looking at resistance to fungicides, um, there's really two main types of resistance that can occur in the field. And that's really dependent on the mode of action being utilized. So for instance, when we're looking at strabilurin resistance across the globe, it's been determined that it's monogenic resistance, meaning single gene resistance. So essentially, it's an on-off switch. You either have full and outright resistance, or there's no resistance, and there's nothing in between. So a single mutation, changing a single amino acid sequence, confers 100% resistance. So when considering the type of resistance that is common with triazoles or group 3s, it's a little bit different than single gene resistance. It's termed either multi-gene resistance or shifting type resistance. So with triazoles, to confer 100% resistance, you need up to four mutations on four different genes to confer resistance. So what often happens is this stepwise erosion of control where you get a single mutation and you lose a little bit of efficacy and you get another mutation and you lose a little bit more. But what occurs is if you remove that selection pressure of the fungicide, you'll often get a shifting back to more sensitive species where your triazole chemistry will work again. Because as you accumulate mutations, it often creates a less fit pathogen that's in the field. And um, this is common for triazole chemistry is the shifting type resistance and essentially why triazoles are used globally as the backbone of uh, fungicide resistance management strategies. FRAC has also made recommendations for global applications of, of various modes of action that are key to Western Canada. So they've made recommendations for strabilurins, triazoles, and SDHI chemistries. For strabilurins, they've recommended that whenever applying a strabilurin, it should always be applied in mixtures with a different mode of action. They've also recommended not to apply more than, than two in a season. For triazoles, they've recommended that highly curative uh, type applications should be avoided. And I would say this probably applies to all three of the major modes of action. You want to apply fungicides in a preventative way as much as possible. As if you apply in a curative fashion, you have more pathogens and more potential for the development of resistance. Another key thing for triazoles is essentially the worst thing you can do is apply sublethal rate, so cut rate fungicides. The reason being here is that because of that shifting type of resistance, if you cut your rates, you have more potential selecting for those pathogens that have that, maybe only that single or two mutations in their genome. SDHIs, some recommendations from FRAC include always applying mixtures, again, with non-cross-resistant fungicide, and applying a maximum of two applications a year. There are two major modes of action for fungicides used in Western Canada today, and a third one that there's more and more active ingredients being developed as we move forward. The first one of the major modes of action are the triazoles, or your group three chemistries. Such active ingredients such as tibiconazole, and prothioconazole belong to this group. You have your group 11 chemistries, so these are your strabilurins. Uh, an example of an active ingredient in this group would be trifloxystrobin. So those are your major two modes of action. There, there's more and more active ingredients being developed under the group 7 class of chemistry, or your SDHIs. They're minor today, but they're increasing in size. And these include such active ingredients such as penflufen and fluopyram. So some common resistance type questions that come to us from the field. I've applied Raxel Pro and then I followed up with Prosero later in the season. Am I at risk for fungicide resistance? So since both products contain prothioconazole and tibiconazole, it's natural that these questions come out. Overall, the risk for potential resistance really isn't there and I'll explain why in, in, in three different reasons here. 
First consider the mode of action. Um, it's, it's the triazole group three chemistries where you do have that shifting type of response. So a less riskier mode of action right off the start. Two, for C treatments, there's a relatively, compared to a foliar application, a relatively low amount of active ingredient applied to that seed. It protects the seed very well, but because there's not a lot of active ingredient that systemically moves up to the leaves, you don't get leaf disease protection from C treatments. So if you don't have leaf disease protection, you're not applying a selection pressure to any pathogen that happens to infect those leaves. So when you come with a foliar application later on with Procero, that pathogen hasn't previously been selected for in that same year. And lastly, you have to consider the pathogens being targeted. They're a complete different subset of species for the most part. For seed treatments, you're concerned about pythium and other soil-based pathogens, which we spoke about earlier, are usually have the less risk potential in terms of the development of resistance, where from a foliar perspective, you're targeting such things as scald, rust. So very different uh, subsection of targets based on the seed treatment use versus the foliar use. So another common resistance question that we get is, does applying the same mode of action year over year on different crops select for resistant pathogens? For instance, does applying proline on canola in year one and then coming back with Procero in year two on your cereals, should I be concerned about resistance? Well, uh, basically the answer is no, because you're targeting two different species of pathogens year over year and you're not placing any selection pressure on a single pathogen species. So to boil this down, Cereal diseases can't propagate in canola, and canola diseases can't propagate in cereals, and so vice versa. Your canola can't get Fusarium heblite, your cereals can't get sclerotinia. So you're targeting a totally different subset of pathogen year over year. So overall, in terms of the risk for fungicide resistance in Western Canada, I think it's clear from extensive fungicide use across the years that a resistant risk to date is much less than it is in areas uh, such as Western Europe where fungicide resistance is a large concern. Also, important pathogens of Western Canada such as rust and fusarium are considered lower risk pathogens, but there are also other pathogens out there that are considered medium risk that are just as prevalent, such as sclerotinia and net blotch. What else we know is that complete control failures of triazol chemistries or your group three are very rare even in Europe where resistance is a common concern and where application intensity and disease levels are much higher but are common for strobilurins especially when applied alone so I think the key there is is always using strobilurins with mixed partners of a different mode of action so considering all this there's still agronomic things that growers should consider that can reduce the risk and it's all about reducing the amount of pathogens in your field through agronomic practices. So overall, uh, the fungicide resistant risk in Western Canada is clearly lower than what we have in Western Europe, but especially when FRAC guidelines are applied. So for more information on the potential for fungicide resistance, a great resource is the FRAC website, so Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, and the website is fracfrac.info.